Super Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo was not only the first Mario Kart game ever made, but it also ushered in the trend of mascot racing games, which gave us such wonderful titles like Eminem's Kart Racing. Except Super Mario Kart is actually good. Like, really good. Cited as the start of the kart racing genre, it took the fun racing elements of past driving games and added in combat in the form of shells, lightning, and oil spills. No, wait. They replaced that with the banana peels, that's right. Sorry, there were just so many little changes that happened throughout Super Mario Kart's development. In fact, after learning about the existence of the discovered prototype of the game, this video went from being like 6 minutes long to roughly 20. So on this episode of Beta 64, we're going to learn all about the development of Super Mario Kart. Since the start of Super Mario Kart's development, the team's main focus was always to make a multiplayer racing game, having two players on the screen at the same time, which was different than the previously released Nintendo racing game F-Zero, which could only support one single player. But that's not to say that the team just wanted to create another F-Zero just with multiplayer, it's that they wanted to create a game with two players on screen at the same time, that's it. Because of this focus though, Super Mario Kart didn't implement very complex tracks, like those seen in F-Zero, due to the limitations of the SNES. Some actually say that this focus on multiplayer is the reason why, despite playing Super Mario Kart in single player, the game still has it in split screen mode, just with the map taking up the bottom half of the screen. But while racing is the main focus of Super Mario Kart, there's also that fun battle mode that was added in by the team. They did this in order to provide a mode that allowed for one-on-one -on -one gameplay without the player's victory simply being decided by having them compete for rank. During this time of the development process, Mario, or even racing in general, was nowhere to be found. Instead, the main driver in this game was just some random guy in overalls driving around aimlessly. That was kept until around 3-4 to four months into development, when the team finally managed to get two players driving on the screen at once. While looking at what they had done so far, the team wondered what it would look like with Mario driving the cart instead of this random guy they had. And after implementing this design change, they jointly decided that having Mario in the game looked better than what they had previously designed. And thusly, Super Mario Kart was born. Now in case you didn't know, in order to achieve the 3D effect of the game, the team used a graphics mode on the SNES called Mode 7. But what is Mode 7? In short, it basically allowed developers to create a 3D effect by freely rotating and scaling planes. It was implemented in F-Zero and later used in Super Mario RPG, Super Mario World, A Link to the Past, Chrono Trigger, and many other SNES titles, including Super Mario Kart. But in order to handle the 3D floating point math associated with this effect, Super Mario Kart also had to use an additional DSP-1 chip, which actually later became the most used DSP chip in all SNES games. Fast forward to sometime around July of 2008, when Simon Belmont, a well-known prototype collector, sold a huge chunk of his collection to help fund his business ventures. Among all of these prototypes being sold, including Earthbound, there was actually two development carts of Super Mario Kart that were purchased. While one of them was an exact duplicate of the final US release, the other wasn't. And the lucky guy who got this changed proto was the Digit Press user Van Halen. And if you're watching this Van Halen, please email me at contact at beta64.tv. I'd really like to talk with you about it. To give a bit of history of how that prototype came about, it was actually first owned by Jason Wilson, who was the senior editor of the magazine Tips and Tricks. And after years of moving around, it eventually found its way to Van Halen. And thank goodness it did. Being the awesome guy that Van Halen is, he took various screenshots and videos of the game to showcase the differences. So what do you say we take a look at those differences then? Now, a bit of a disclaimer, while Van Halen has gone through a lot of trouble to list out the differences for us, we still don't have many screenshots or videos of these changes. So sadly, I won't be able to show you a lot of the changes I'll be discussing, so I guess just imagine it and take our word for it. Alright, first let's start with the title screen, which has the trademark logo in a different place than the final, above the Mario Kart text, instead of below. And not only that, the logo box in this proto isn't as wide as the final US release. 
It turns out though that the reason behind this logo change is that the prototype despite being in English is using the Japanese title screen logo. However, it doesn't appear to be exactly the same as the Japanese version though. As some have pointed out, Mario's mouth looks to be somewhat different, perhaps a bit more open on the final version compared to the prototype. Besides the logo, the other thing that's different in this version is that you can't press the select button in the prototype to move the cursor, despite the fact that you could do that in most SNES games, likely meaning they just hadn't implemented that functionality quite yet. Also, if you stay on the title screen for some time in both versions, you'll get to view a demo of a race. However, while the final will show one of four races, in the prototype, there's only this one. Next is the driver select screen, which has a few small changes too. First, Bowser's jaw sticks out slightly more in the proto, and the back of Mario and Luigi's cart also sticks out slightly more as well. What I found the most interesting about these drivers though, is that Luigi is looking up in the final, but in the prototype he's looking forward. I don't know why the artist would have purposely changed it so that way he looks up, but that's just what they did and I'm not going to judge their artistic choices, even though every other kart racer looks forward. Now, those differences may have been small, but don't worry, the cup select screen that comes next is very different. It's missing all of the outside border that comes with it, as well as the CC class label. Alright, why don't we head for the races now? First off, there's some general differences related to all races that need to be covered. In both versions, when there's no item in the item box, the player's number will be displayed in the box instead. The difference is that in the proto, it'll show a P for player next to the number, which was ultimately removed from the retail version. Oh, also, do you remember in the final game that if you drive in too many circles, you'll spin out? Well, that's not a thing in the prototype, so feel free to drive in as many circles to your heart's content, because the game's not gonna care. Well, I mean, Lakitu might care and tell you that you're going the wrong way, which by the way, he does differently in the proto. The flag that he uses in this version is missing the X that's on the final flag. And also, speaking of Lakitu, unlike the final, he doesn't charge coins to save you in the prototype. How nice. There's some other big differences too, like the fact that you can't get a speed boost at the beginning of a race in the prototype, and you can't throw banana peels in front of you, or drop green shells behind you either. And speaking of items, despite the fact that the lightning bolt is shown on the item roulette, you can never get it sadly. Or maybe gladly. I never did like it. Also, if you collide with a pipe while using a star, instead of kicking it off screen like in the final, you'll actually jump over it like you're using a feather power up. And speaking of jumping, you can actually jump slightly higher in the proto too. Just a little bit. Some other various changes include not being able to drive over sunken drivers, no extra lives in cups, and with Luigi, no matter what, his cart will keep rolling. Always. Forever. Next, let's talk about thwomps. One thing you'll want to know is that in the retail version, thwomps don't start moving until the second lap. However, in the prototype, they're always moving throughout the entire race. Oh, and you remember those special star thwomps that are shown in Rainbow Road? Well, in the proto, they don't appear, but instead they're replaced by the regular thwomp version. And since we're on Rainbow Road already, it turns out that in the prototype of the track, it's much more difficult to get around because the track is narrower than the final. In fact, it's so narrow that the computer drivers fall off constantly, much like I always did. Now let's take a look at some other tracks, like Mario Circuit, where the only change is that the oil spill doesn't spin out the player, which is very odd, so likely it just hadn't been implemented as of that prototype build. Next up is Donut Plains 2 and their Monty Moles, which actually changed fundamentally between both versions. To refresh, in the final game when you hit a Monty Mole, it will attach itself to the front of the cart, slow you down, and cause you to drop coins until you knock it off. In the proto though, it will simply spin out the player and cause them to lose coins. Kinda boring, yes, so I'm glad they changed that. Now let's move on a little bit to Donut Plains 3, which as you likely remember contains a broken bridge. Well, it turns out that the AI in the prototype isn't exactly perfected for this stage because they will constantly fall into the water trying to cross the bridge. This was fixed before release, unlike most games that come out nowadays. Time for Chaco Island, which according to Van Halen, feels a bit more slippery when driving in the mud compared to the final. Now for Chaco Island 2 specifically, there's a couple of differences with its track design. 
At the first mud puddle, unlike the final where the stripe wall comes out at an angle, the prototype has it making sharp 90 degree turns until it gets to almost the same place. And since we're at this mud puddle, there's a big change with it too, as it originally had a break in the mud around the end of the puddle, making it more of a paw print shape instead of the huge puddle that it is in the final. Vanilla Lake 1 also has some differences associated with its striped wall. First, at the second straightaway, instead of there being just one pair of walls, there were actually going to be two, see? And at the end of the third straightaway, there's slightly bit more of a wall peeking out compared to the final. The last specific track we'll look at is Koopa Beach, and there's a couple general differences with this track, like the fact that the waves aren't animated, and the cheap cheeps are upside down when they flop around, unlike the final. Specifically for Koopa Beach 1 though, there's a lot more seaweed on this island than what eventually made it. Whew, we finished a race. Now let's take a look at the result screen, which has one difference. Racers that didn't make it across the finish line are labeled as out on the time list, however in the retail version it gives them a time anyway, despite the fact that they never technically finished. After finishing the cup, it's time for the award ceremony, which has quite a few differences in the prototype that aren't seen in the retail release. The first difference I notice in comparing both versions is that the clouds are generic in the proto instead of the mushrooms like in the final. But now for this image specifically, when winning first place in the 100cc mushroom cup as Toad, the word gold in Toad wins the gold is on the same line as Great Race, unlike the final version which separates the two. Sadly, I don't have images of the other characters winning in the proto, so I don't know if this is just for Toad in the 100cc Mushroom Cup, or if it's a formatting difference that happens for more characters in other cups. Another thing that stands out in this image is Donkey Kong Jr. Notice that he's missing his signature letter on his shirt, which is an odd thing to forget since he has always had one, even since he was first created. Now this is where the real changes come in. When coming in second place in the proto, instead of that giant cheap cheap coming out and giving you a silver cup, you get nothing. And instead a super koopa flies in a loop on screen, only to get hit by the champagne bottled cork. For third place you also get a different cinematic, with four koopa paratroopas flying across the screen, and sadly for the last one, it also gets hit by a cork from the champagne bottle. And after that amazing award ceremony for the special cup, instead of getting the end credits and unlocking the 150cc class, nothing happens in the proto. So basically you can only play from 50cc to 100cc in the prototype with no way to unlock the rest, if it even exists in there. Okay now what about time trials, are there differences there? Well it turns out there are some, like how you go wildly out of control after finishing a race when the computer takes control of your cart or how the replay option isn't available after completing a trial, even if you get a good enough time. But in the end, the course select screen changed even more than all of these. Or should I say, the course select screen, because select has been misspelled in the prototype. Regarding the cup select text on the left side of the screen, you should have already noticed a big difference. The text defaults as white and flashes red when selecting a course in the proto, however in the final, it's the other way around. It defaults to red and flashes white instead. One thing that's very interesting is that Bowser's Castle 3 in time trial mode has something that's not normally on the track. In the center of the three lanes in the course, there's one of those dreaded stripe walls just hanging out there, though it's very likely that it was put there by accident since this level isn't supposed to have color walls to begin with. Lastly, battle mode. There's really only one change here though, but it's pretty big. Turns out that Battle Course 3 was actually going to originally be themed after Chaco Island instead of Vanilla Lake. But though they may look similar in design, these two courses are actually slightly different. Here, let me circle a few of these changes. One interesting thing that's a big problem for this battle course in the proto is that Lakitu can't seem to figure out how to get you back onto the stage if you manage to jump out of it. That was obviously just a bug that they thankfully managed to fix before the final release. Turns out there's actually a lot of early music tracks and sounds in the prototype that have been documented. However, most of them have yet to be ripped. So sadly, we won't be able to hear what most of them sound like. So I've decided in this video to only talk about the ones that we can definitely hear and a few others that piqued my interest. If you want to check out the descriptions for the other sounds, click the link in the description. So let's start out with an early version of Donkey Kong Jr's victory theme, which played obviously after winning a race while playing as Donkey Kong Jr. 
It sounds very different from the final version in almost every way. Just take a listen and you'll know what I mean. The themes for Yoshi, Peach, and Toad were all changed too in one way or another, but we don't have a way to listen to those so you'll just have to take our word for it. There's also some other interesting little tidbits about some other tracks, like how Bowser's castle theme plays on Rainbow Road, or no matter what place you come in the cup, the fourth place music will always play. Plus whenever you cross the finish line in time trial mode, the finished music doesn't even play at all. In case you couldn't tell, there's quite a few issues with this build of the game. The most interesting music track that we can actually hear is Vanilla Lake's theme, which, oh my, sounds completely different. This early theme sounds like something out of Star Fox, to be honest, and it doesn't even fit with the rest of the game in my opinion. All in all though, it's super good. Very catchy. Take a listen. Now it turns out there's only one single unused thing in Super Mario Kart other than the debug mode, and that one thing is an unused multicolored block. It kind of has the same color as those walls in the game, however placing the block in game, despite looking like walls, doesn't act like them. It actually just acts like the road, allowing you to drive over it with ease. And that's it, that's the development of Super Mario Kart. You know, despite the lack of unused stuff in the game, that's been found. The fact that there's a prototype of the game and that the owner is willing to give us this much info about it is fantastic. I hope in the future we'll be able to get more screenshots, videos, and audio from the prototype to see what else we can discover. But until then, this has been Beta64 with the development of Super Mario Kart. Thanks for watching.